Hello. Let's get started. Today we're going to continue talking about neural networks, and then hopefully, if we have enough time, we're also going to cover convolutions. What we talked about last time was this idea of neural networks being some kind of strange recursively defined function that you can learn the parameters of and do a good job of supervised learning for. And we looked at all of these kinds of pictures last time. And deep learning was essentially just another name for neural networks, but in particular meant you have a bunch of these so-called layers where you multiply by a matrix, do the nonlinearity, non and multiply by a matrix, and so on. So uh, two things I wanted to say last time but forgot. One is that there's a very good video on YouTube that talks about neural networks, which I posted on the course webpage and put highly recommended next to it. So I suggest you check that out if you haven't already. Uh, it's really nicely done. The second thing is that someone asked me after class about what is, why is it called neural? What does this have to do with the brain and biology and all that? And I just wanted to say that while I'm not going to go through all that stuff, there's a whole bunch of bonus slides about it at the end of last lecture. It just very recently occurred to me that um, both Friday and Monday are holidays, so I had to kind of cram the schedule a little more than I originally planned, but I think it's going to be just fine. OK. So this last time we talked all about what the thing is, and we didn't say anything about loss functions. Today we need to talk about training. And so the first thing I want to say is that at least when you're doing regression, pretty much all the stuff about loss functions is in play. So you can use squared error. You could use other losses. Squared error is particularly standard choice. Um, and so this. W multiplies h uh, by x. Then we do this nonlinearity h. That gives us our new features. And then from there, it just looks like linear regression. So some vector times um, the features. The most popular way of training these things is with stochastic gradient, although I posted another video on the course website from a recent machine learning conference talking about how the whole field of deep learning is lacking rigor, and people just blindly apply stochastic gradient, even though it often doesn't work. And I'll, oh, pretty interesting talk, so I recommend that as well if you're interested. Um, nonetheless, people usually use stochastic gradient. And this whole neural net loss is very non convex. There is a whole bunch of, so. Even with PCA, we talked about things like permuting the rows and stuff. And some of that intuition applies here to why the, the loss is non-convex. But in general, this thing, as you add more layers and it gets more and more complicated, is really non-convex. And there's no, not that much I can say to make you feel better about it, except that, well, sort of what I've been saying about PCA, which is that it often kind of works out. But with PCA, there were some more guarantees around that. Uh, and here, it's a pretty unexplored area in terms of people are actively working on trying to understand whether the solutions are good or not, and all these kinds of things. So as usual, whatever we do to optimize this thing, it's going to involve a gradient of the loss. and. Backpropagation is the word used to describe computing, how you compute the gradient with neural networks. And you might say, well, what do you mean, how do I compute a gradient? We've been doing this for the whole course. You just do it. Um, but the point is that here, I mean, pen and paper, like you, you can take a gradient, right? But the thing is that here, um, there's different ways in which you could attempt to compute the gradient. Even though you all agree what it is mathematically, there's different ways of computing it. And some are particularly wasteful, and some are particularly efficient. And backpropagation basically means <coughs> the good way of computing the gradient. Uh, and there's yet another video about this that I also posted by the same person as the first video. So 
Here's how we can think about backpropagation. First, we stick in some x vector and we do the forward propagation, which really just means running the predict function like we've been doing on anything for the whole semester. But here, it, there may be multiple steps involved in even running the predict function because of this kind of iteration or recursion through the layers. So this is just a, a one layer network, but you could imagine a whole bunch of layers. So you keep computing the next one. Next layer, z values from the previous layer, z values. So with back propagation, you want to compute the gradient with respect to the parameters, but what are the parameters? They're all over the place. Layer one has parameters, layer two has parameters, and you need to compute the partial derivative with respect to all of those parameters over the loss. And one way you can think about that is in terms of the chain rule. If I start with x, I use it to get z1, I use that to get z2, I use that to get y, I use y to get the loss. So I'm basically composing a bunch of operations, and now I want the derivative of the final thing with respect to the parameters. The chain rule kind of undoes composing a bunch of functions for you and tells you how to take the derivatives of the inner things. So that's essentially how backpropagation works or how you take gradients in neural network. There's this chain rule of unwinding all this composing of different operations. And so you can think of it as going backwards, starting from the loss and, and basically un, unchaining these functions to get these derivatives. OK, so um, I took out the rest of the back, back prop slides and put them in the bonus slides. This is a very contentious uh, issue, I guess, or complicated decision. So there's different schools of thought on how much you need to know. I actually, even though I made you take less gradients than other semesters of this course, I still think it's a bit more than necessary. I don't know what you think. but. Um, it's a complicated question, and um, one thing I haven't talked about in the course is something called automatic differentiation, which you'd probably be very depressed about if you heard about it because you'd wonder why you took all those derivatives. But um, there, there's software out there that actually um, can take derivatives of pieces of code in very elegant ways. That is, it's not just using numerical approximations like you may have seen in, say, Computer Science 303, but it's kind of doing this thing I described of just applying the chain rule. So um, there's all kinds of software now that people use for deep learning, like TensorFlow, PyTorch. You can kind of write whatever you want, and you never have to take the gradient, especially with, I think PyTorch is particularly nice. Um, it just kind of handles that for you. On the other hand, um, there's, uh, there's this article I'm linking to by uh, Andre Carpathy, who's a big deep learning person and is also a UBC grad, who's saying, no, you have to do this. You can read about it if you want to hear all the arguments. Um, Where is that posted? There's a link here in the slide. You should be able to get it from the PDF. <coughs> OK, well, then ask me later. And I'll, I'll get you the, the post. But, um, Right now, that yeah, this course is just a lot of a lot of people coming at this course from different angles, uh, and I don't want to spend like 20 minutes going through this. Um, so here's what I really want you to know at, at a minimum. Um, I want you to think of some have some intuition about why there are even different ways of computing this gradient, and basically. As I mentioned, it's, it's the chain rule. So if, let me go back a couple of slides just for a minute. So here, the, you can take the derivative of the loss with respect to those kind of last layers, or that, that last v uh, vector. And it's just kind of a usual derivative as we have in linear regression. But then um, it also depends on the z's. And the z's depend on the w coming from before, so you have a derivative there. But those z's also depend on the previous z's, which depend on the w's from even before that. So to actually get a derivative with respect to the first layer of w's, 
you need to unchain this thing all the way down and then get the derivative with respect to the w's. And if you want to do it for the second layer, you would do almost all of that unchaining but just kind of fall off at a slightly different point and get the derivatives with, this, with respect to different w's. And there's just a redundant computation in there that you don't want to keep doing all this unchaining over and over again for every layer. So you just want to kind of store or memoize properly um, and that's what this note is about bookkeeping um, here. Oops, sorry. That's what this note is about bookkeeping. You just want to store useful things that you've computed so that you don't keep computing the same things over and over again. Otherwise, it'll be slow. So that's important to me. Um, and the other thing is just to think about how long does this take. So you're doing a bunch of matrix multiplications and have some kind of vague idea of the cost of computing this gradient. <coughs> Excuse me. Which depends on all the sizes of the different layers. Okay. Um, questions or comments? All right. So last time we also talked about this is a bit of a digression, but. We talked, we've been talking about regression the whole time, but you can also use neural nets for classification. And the way that works is, well, if you just have two class classification, you can do, as I sort of alluded to last time, instead of having a lin linear regression at the end, you can have a logistic regression at the end, and then you interpret that number as a probability, and your very last layer has this sigmoid hanging off of it. If you have multi-class classification, <coughs> excuse me, then you can use a sigmoid function to get a whole bunch of probabilities and everything's sort of exactly the same. So you can think of it as sticking a softmax logistic regression on the last layer. Um, in terms of neural net code, it's pretty common if you're using software packages that they will want you to do a one hot encoding um, to the labels. And I think I've mentioned that before, but basically turning the index 3 into the vector 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 to just, um, so your, your targets, your y goes from a vector of labels to this matrix, um, sort of like when we were talking about k-means as well. So that's not really a conceptual thing, it's just sometimes the software will expect you to pre-process your data in a certain way to have these one-hot vectors instead of integers, and it's just good to be aware of that. Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of words. So um, what we in this class call the softmax loss has a whole bunch of different names. I think softmax loss might not be its most formal name, but uh, you'll also see cross entropy loss, and I think it has other names as well. So just something to keep in mind if you see that. It's nothing new. It's just uh, the same softmax loss we talked about when we talked about logistic regression. Okay. Um, so the ImageNet challenge is uh, a computer vision competition that's been going on for the last several years in which deep learning tends to dominate. Um, and there, there's more about ImageNet in the bonus slides of the last lecture as well. But you're essentially shown, shown pictures of things uh, and you try to recognize what it's a picture of. So some lessons learned from what is actually, what leads to getting good performance on this data set. Um, image transformations, I think we talked about a little bit, did we talk about this? Okay, yeah. So we talked about this earlier in the course about how you might invent new training data by doing stuff to the image that you know shouldn't change the class and then adding that as a new training example. And the other big thing is optimization. Uh, and that's what we really need to talk about today. So we 
Optimization wasn't really making or breaking our methods earlier in the course. Logistic regression or um, PCA, all kinds of things we've been talking about, random forests. We wanted to know how to do it, but it wasn't like this person did a great job with the optimization, this person did a bad job, and that model ended up so much better, right? But with neural nets, that is kind of the reality. And again, it comes back to this issue of this non-convexity and just also very, very high dimensional situation, right? Because again, if you have 10,000 features, then your logistic regression has 10,000 parameters. But if you have another layer of 10,000 latent features, then you suddenly have 10 to the 8 parameters because you have a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix sitting there at the first layer. So the numbers of parameters are much bigger than anything we've dealt with earlier in the course, which also makes the optimization problem much harder because, well, probably most of us have a hard enough time finding our way in this three-dimensional world. So you can imagine trying to find the thing you're looking for in a thousand dimensions or finding the thing you're looking for in 10 billion dimensions or 100 billion or whatever. Um, it gets to be a very difficult <coughs> search problem. So most of the, as I mentioned earlier, most of the successful optimization algorithms are stochastic gradient or some variant. And there's now a whole bunch of variants of stochastic gradient with funny sounding names that try to improve on it and, and do better optimization for deep learning. Again, this is sort of an active area that people are working on, but it's not <laughs> even that clear to people why uh, the optimization is hard. Are we getting stuck in local minima? How many local minima are there? What about saddle points and all other kinds of things? Um, I, it's not super clear what's going on when we try to optimize these deep networks. And that, in that second video I mentioned, the talk about rigor, that's part of, of what was discussed. And just a general concern about the field, which is we don't quite know what's going on. We just know that we get good results. And so let's keep doing it. So initialization, we. This is, OK, we've seen initialization mattering before, for example, with k-means, uh, that sometimes with a bad initial, initialization, we got bad results. So here, initialization is a big deal. And there's all kinds of weird things that can happen if you don't initialize properly. And there was some discussion about this on Piazza already in this course. But you can't just initialize everything to 0. So for example, imagine your first layer is all 0, it's just a giant matrix of 0. Whatever comes in, it's going to multiply that, and 0 is going to come out. And then you just have 0 like coming into the rest of the network. And so if I try to change the next layer's weights, it's not going to matter, because I'm just multiplying something by 0 anyway. So it's pretty common to initialize the weights randomly. And you can draw them from some distribution, like a normal distribution with some small variance or <coughs> something like that. OK. Um, that's fine. You can tell I'm just breezing through this. I'm, I'm quite aware of that, but um, that is intentional. OK. So there's also this issue of step size. So we've talked about step size before. How do you change the step size? With stochastic gradient, the step size should decrease. Uh, this is really important to pick this well when training deep networks. And often, the, the people might just say, well, how are things going? Let's, let me look at my loss versus number of iterations. Is it going down or is it not? Going back to our stochastic <laughs> gradient lecture, are we in that ball of confusion or are we not there yet? So maybe you see something like this, decrease step size, get more improvement, and so on and so forth. So this isn't very satisfying because it's not even an automated procedure. And it's obviously completely subjective. Um, but I guess the fact that this is done kind of clues us into uh, where, where 
where we're at and how hard this problem is. So there's all a whole bunch of tricks here. I mean, I could have probably an entire course just on deep learning and the tricks to get them to work. Um, but some couple of other tricks that are pretty common are maybe you want to treat the bias parameters differently than the weight parameters. And momentum is super popular in terms of, um, and there's a good article on momentum that I should post on the course website if I remember. But it's this idea that um, the direction you go in is not just the gradient direction, but it's an average or a combination of the gradient direction and the direction you were going in before. So that's sort of like what momentum is. I have a certain amount of momentum in this direction. I can't just completely change directions on the next iteration. But if I was going this way and then the gradient tells me to go that way, maybe I'll go in some intermediate direction so I'm not kind of zigzagging all over the place. Uh, this turns out to be hugely effective in training deep learning models. And it's a pretty common theme in this field that people do stuff, it works, everyone starts doing it, and then people start thinking about why it works. And <laughs> again, that's both good and bad. I mean, it's really complicated, right? Because there's been so much progress, which is great, but um, it's also worrying. Oh. Sorry, I forgot the second half of the slide, right? So this is a combination between the gradient direction um, and the previous direction that you were going in. OK, so there's other ways of setting the step size. Um, you can take a subset of your data so that things are faster. Remember, things can be very slow here, taking hours, days, even weeks to train. So you can take a subset of your data to try to figure out what works well, and then use that on your full data set. Uh, and these are some of the funny named things that I was referring to earlier. There's all kinds of variants of stochastic gradient that should help you pick the right step size adaptively. Another pretty recent trick is called batch normalization, which has to do with a, a normalization of your, your Z values as you're training. So again, it's just sort of a meta comment. I guess there's two purposes to what I'm doing here. I'm just spamming out a huge number of tricks. A, so that you're aware of them. B, so that you can go back and refer to this later if you're working on this. Um, and C, just to build an awareness for you guys that this is actually pretty complicated. And unlike earlier parts of the course, we can't just do gradient descent or use find min dot pi that I've given you or whatever uh, and just assume it's going to work, right? There's just huge amounts of effort going into actually being able to train these things. OK, here's more stuff to worry about. We talked about the sigmoid last time. So the sigmoid function is pretty much flat, very far away from the middle. And you have a bunch of layers here. So you can kind of think of this as, well, am I taking a sigmoid of a sigmoid of a sigmoid? Um, and if so, remember, you're multiplying these things through the chain rule. So you can get this situation called the vanishing gradient problem that the gradients are super, super tiny and you don't make a lot of progress. And the thing is, that is the gradient. It's not like you made a mistake in computing the gradient. It's just the thing that it turned out to be was extremely small. And can I deal with that with the step size? Or I don't know. I'm using what I thought was a reasonable step size, but the gradient's so small. Um, and you can get into trouble because of this. So I five-ish years ago, um, maybe a little more, 
people started using this ReLU, which we talked about last class. So if you recall, when I was doing the Jupyter demo last time, I showed you what the functions look like for both the sigmoid activation and the ReLU activation. And ReLU is actually the default in the software we were using, which <laughs> speaks to its popularity. So the ReLU function looks like this. It takes, basically, in words, it takes negative values and sets them to zero. In math, it's the max of 0 and x. And this sounds a little crazy. Um, I guess it satisfies our one main requirement for an activation function, which was to not be linear. The whole story of last time was if we didn't have an activation function, which is the same as saying it's linear, and we're just doing a whole bunch of matrix multiplication stacked on top of each other, which doesn't actually build complexity. Um, and here, we do that, but we solve the, the vanishing gradient problem. OK. Um, we talked about this last time. Overfitting, major problem here, right? A lot of parameters, a lot of complexity, a lot of opportunity to overfit the training data. As we have deeper and wider networks, we have more and more parameters and more of this issue. So people are using networks with 20 layers, even more, 50 layers, especially in the last few years. And there's a whole bunch of regularization to get this to work. So you can do standard L2 regularization when now you have this huge number of terms, right? Because each layer has its own W. And you could imagine picking different lambdas for each one, which brings you into the world of a lot of hyperparameters. Um, again, neural net literature sometimes has its own <coughs> words for things we already know. So you might see this called weight decay, but that just means L2 regularization. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would love to talk a lot about hyperparameter optimization, which is something dear to my heart. Uh, I think the, the most important thing to say is just keep an eye out, and you'll see how many hyperparameters we're collecting here. Like, ridiculously many. Um, and that's why being able to tune the hyperparameters is so important. And yet, it's also so challenging, because if the thing takes an hour to train, how are we expected to try thousands of different hyperparameter configurations? Or maybe it takes a week to train, and that's a lot worse. OK, so there's so much overfitting that we want to use more than just one type of regularization. Uh, another popular type is called early stopping. And the idea here is if you look at number of iterations, and the training error, you, you expect the training error to go down. And the validation error might start to go up. Um, this is loss. So we've seen a lot of pictures that look like this, where the x-axis is the hyperparameter, like regularization. That is not the same picture we're drawing. It just happens to look pretty much the same, right? But we're not saying when I, add, when I t remove regularization, training error goes down and validation error starts going up. Fine. But we're actually saying I'm fixing the hyperparameters and just looking at as I progress with the optimization, and this is kind of weird, right? Because this is, to me, more surprising than the previous statement. The previous statement was like, we start to overfit. OK, that makes total sense. But this is a weirder thing. It's saying, as I do a better job of solving my optimization problem, I actually start to do worse on the validation set. Um, and so this idea of early stopping is, I'm just going to terminate right here when the validation error starts going up. So I will purposely do a bad job of minimizing the loss. Um, this upsets some people because it's a little weird. I mean, you might say, why didn't you just design a better loss that had more regularization so that you actually wanted to optimize it? What is this weird thing, right? I'm going to pick. I get to pick the loss anyway. No, it's not that someone else gets to pick it. So why am I picking it? 
and then not actually solving the problem. And yet, um, this is a pretty common thing that people do. And you're not actually measuring the validation error at every single iteration because you're doing stochastic gradient and that would be too slow. But every some number of iterations, uh, you can measure that, or every epoch. Um, and then, so this is a picture of training accuracy rather than error, so it's flipped upside down. But the other thing is that even training accuracy doesn't necessarily look like this smooth curve. It might look like what you see up there, that things get a lot better. And then it looks like you're done, like training accuracy has plateaued. And then after a while, they just start getting better again, um, which is challenging, right? So <laughs> it's, it's hard to decide when you're done. Um, and, and that makes neural network optimization particularly challenging. <coughs> Any questions or comments? Yeah, I mean. Uh, can you checkpoint your neural net when you're like facing something like this? Like just store like the current configuration and then the end you look at like where your validation error was the lowest and it's gonna stop. Can you checkpoint your neural net? So sure, you can checkpoint your neural net, store the weights at any iteration, but what are you proposing to do with those checkpoints? Well, then you would avoid problems like this of like, I mean, I guess you're stopping early to save time, but, and to get a better net, but here if you like checkpoint it, then you can just use the best configuration. Okay, right, yes. Yeah. So, yes, you can also checkpoint you can store your weights at a bunch of checkpoints and then go back afterwards and at each checkpoint compute the validation error and then take the best one, sure. But um, the idea here is typically you probably wouldn't see this. So if it started going up, you'd probably just be done. But you're right. If this could happen, then what you suggested makes more sense. OK, um, now things are getting very strange. So uh, dropout is from, I think, 2012. It's another form of regularization for neural nets that um, you randomly set some of your activations to 0, randomly chosen per iteration of optimization. So this is a very bizarre idea. like. Why are my randomly setting stuff to zero? Um, would be my reaction. Essentially, the idea is the intuition for this is if you remember way back when we first talked about L2 regularization for the first time, I showed you this polynomial fitting through a few points, and this polynomial went totally crazy because it was perfectly fitting all the points and had to do crazy stuff. Um, and then I said, hey, look at, let's look at those coefficients. They're really large. And they're just passing through the points, canceling each other out nicely, but they're doing crazy stuff everywhere else. Um, and then regularization will make the coefficient smaller, and that will help. So what's happening here, or at least the way it's described, is that, well, let's say I, was, I had that polynomial situation, and then I set one of the terms to 0, like the x to the 5 term. Well, now they wouldn't be perfectly canceling each other out, and my training error would be horribly bad, whereas if I had a simpler model like not without such large coefficients, then by knocking out a piece of it, it wouldn't mess everything up so bad. And so it ends up kind of promoting less crazy values of the coefficients in that way. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of implement de implementation details about this. And um, I had a, a demo prepared, actually, but I'm not sure it's worth the time because it's already a little bit going out of fashion. It's been super popular. I wouldn't be surprised if it's super popular for a while longer, but I wouldn't be surprised if the version of this course five, 10 years from now doesn't have any mention of dropout. So um, we'll see. I mean, who knows? But um, these things do come and go. <laughs> Definitely, there's been a huge amount of success with dropout in the last five years. <laughs> 
OK. So did I talk about these things? Um, I talked about one hot encoding. I talked about dropout. I talked about weight decay as just another name for L2 regularization. I talked about momentum as this way of making each iteration biased a little bit towards the way you were going before instead of just a new gradient direction. I very briefly mentioned batch normalization as, as a thing. Didn't really talk about it. Um, gradient clipping I didn't mention, so we don't need to deal with that, do we? Uh, we talked about vanishing gradient, that's what I meant to say. We talked about the vanishing gradient problem where you have a bunch of chained sigmoids and you get these very tiny gradients at the early layers because they're being propagated back through so many layers. OK, that was my ridiculously fast brain dump of tricks that you use to train neural networks. What I want to do for the last 15 minutes is get started on convolutions so that we can have convolutions more or less covered today. And then we could talk about convolutional neural networks on Wednesday. Um, and then we have the two holidays after that. So here we go. So convolutional neural networks, aka convnets, are super popular. They completely take over any kind of um, computer vision tasks these days. So they're very important. And we are going to talk about them on Wednesday. But first, we need to say what a convolution really is. So a convolution is a way of looking at linear operations, a specific way. And convolutions kind of have its own terminology. So the convolution between A and B or B and A are the same thing, but we tend to think of one of the two as the signal and one of the two as the filter. So anyone coming from well, a whole bunch of backgrounds, electrical engineering, maybe physics, math, um, you've likely seen this before. But if you haven't, that's totally fine. So we'll just talk about 1D for the moment. We have this thing called the signal. We have this thing called the filter. And we're going to do something to those two things and get an output. And the output is also going to be a sequence. So we have a sequence and a two sequences coming into this thing and one sequence coming out. But you can think of it as you start with the signal and I'm applying this convolution to it um, with a particular filter and then I'm getting something out. And um, the math is saying, what the math is saying is that the way I compute a com each element of the output is that I am basically taking a dot product between the two things, but centered in a particular way. And I want to show it to you like this. So here's an si example signal, example filter. And let's try to compute the convolution between the two things. And let's try to compute the fourth element of the output. So here's the way it works. We're going to take the filter. We're going to center it at the fourth element of the input. So we're going to slide the filter until it's centered at the fourth element of the input. And then we're just going to dot product the two things. So here's the part of the input that is centered at the fourth position. Here are those five things. Then we're going to take the dot product between this filter vector and this piece of the input or signal. And so we're going to do 1 times 1 plus, uh, sorry, 1 times 0 plus 1 times negative 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 3 times negative 1 plus 5 times 0. And then we're going to get this result. So that's how you compute a single element of the output. And then if I want to compute the third value, I'm sliding the filter so that it's centered around the third value instead of sliding it so that it's centered around the fourth value. Um, so for example, for the fifth one, we can do the same thing. So maybe I'll just write it down. Might be helpful. In and zero. So if we want to find this element, 
We're centering the filter around the particular element. And then we're basically dot producting this with that. So this has so far just been a very, very technical definition of something. And I haven't said anything about why you should care, but I'm about to. Um, well, first I'll say why, what this means. And then next time we'll talk about why it's so useful for neural networks and machine learning. But any questions about the technical definition of if I gave you some signal vector and some filter vector, would you be able to compute the convolution? Fred? And then Tom? Does the size of W have to be odd? Does the size of W have to be odd? Um, no. I mean, you, OK, you'll ha if it's not, you'll have to have some convention of where it's centered. But yeah, we'll just assume that it is for the moment. Yeah. Tom? Why would you have a W that starts and ends with zeros? Why would you not just remove those? Yeah, elements? that's a good point. Tom asks, why would you have a W that starts and ends with zeros? I agree. If you add more and more zeros to the ends of W, it doesn't do anything. So there's, there's, there's no point. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not a good example for that reason. Yeah. Tom? Is there any reason you're using the terminology sequence in your signal? No, there's no reason, no. I mean, I, yeah. You can ask Mark who made the slide, but it's just an example. Yeah. Mohammed? How is the filter different from the kernel we talked about earlier? How are the filters different from the kernel I talked about earlier? Like, we were doing the same operation, right? Like, there are the fe feature space and we're doing um, dot product, but not between the same. OK. Um, they are related. And yes, they both involve dot products. Um, they aren't the same thing. When we talked about kernels, we were talking about taking pairs of examples. Um, but here, we're not going to be thinking that way at all. So we'll, we just want to think about we have one example signal thing, and then what is this filter going to do to it? Um, and that, that's all I want to say for the moment. OK, so some of these filters have names, like this one. And I, I guess Tom is not going to like this one either. But um, this one is the identity filter, because wherever you stick it, it's just going to take that same value, multiply it by 1, and just throw away everything else. So it's not going to change anything. And that's why we call it the identity. So this is the identity filter, because we take the convolution with it, and nothing happens. We can have a translation case where if we stick that filter on the first point, it's going to grab the second element, which is 1. Then we stick it at the next position, it's going to grab the third element, and so on. And we have this issue now of boundaries that we're going to have to confront. So we can have an averaging filter. So what does the averaging filter does? Well, at every point, it centers it there and takes a third of that thing plus a third of the thing on the right plus a third of the thing on the left, adds them together. That's the same as taking the average of those two, three things. So actually, doing a moving window average is, can be expressed as a convolution with this filter. <coughs> OK, so I don't want to go too down the rabbit hole of what to do at the boundaries. It's not super relevant for our deep learning that we want to do later this week. Um, but basically, there's a few ways of handling it. You can just assume there's zeros forever and ever. Um, you can assume that the last number gets replicated. There's, there's a whole bunch of conditions. Um, or you can say, you know what, I'm not going to even try to assume what's there. And I'm just going to output something that is smaller than my input. And just, <laughs> I'm not even going to try to say what those things are. So in signal processing, these choices have deep implications. Um, and some of these are related to Fourier transforms. And some of them have all kinds of properties. But for our purposes, we, 
we don't need to get too hung up on this. Yes, Tom. Could you do something like find the sequence and then continue it, but knowing that it was Fibonacci, continue it? If you can't in this case, would that not work? <laughs> <laughs> Let's forget about the Fibonacci thing. Knowing, knowing that, but if there was... Yeah. Like, you You're talking about some kind of extrapolation. Yeah. I, I suppose you could, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's some pictures. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Can you see at the back? Yeah, OK. Um, so here's this thing in the middle is actually not that helpful. It's trying to draw the w, but it makes it look like a continuous function. But it's not a continuous function. It's just a sequence 1, 0, 0, 0. So I'd recommend look at this. Don't worry too much about that. Look at the filter at the top. And then what is this thing going to do? Well, it's going to translate the whole thing over. Um, so this filter, the local averaging, it smooths out some of the craziness in this input signal. And the output, after applying the convolution, is smoother. So these are just the signal is now a long vector, like a 1,000 things. So I'm not going to show you all 1,000 numbers. It's easier to just plot it. Um, and then the output is also just a long vector, and it's easier to just plot it. And we can start to see what these convolutions are actually doing. So what does it mean to take a local average? It means I'm going to get rid of some of the spikiness. And we can also convolve with a bigger filter that takes a bigger window of local averaging. And what that means is that, say I had a reasonable thing, reasonable thing, reasonable thing, and then one giant value, and then reasonable stuff again, right? Now that giant value is getting multiplied by 1 ninth instead of 1 third, and averaged with more reasonable things. So it's going to tone down that peak. And that's pretty much what we're seeing here. Any questions about this? OK. Um, let's skip that. Um, OK, so yes, there's, there's other things we can do other than smoothing filters. So there's also filters that will sharpen edges. So they will make it kind of an even spikier version of what we already have. Um, and we can also. Try to approximate the second derivative of the function with this particular filter. So for those of you who have taken or are taking computer science 303 or have thought about how do I approximate derivatives, um, you can express all that stuff as convolutions. Take a signal of points. You can convolve it with, say, minus 1, 0, 1. What does that mean? It means each thing gets replaced by the next one minus the previous one, and then you have to divide by 2h or whatever it is. But that's basically what you're doing. Um, and same for integrals. And I wouldn't even say these things and convolutions are the same. I would say the, there's like a common ancestor, which is that all these are, are just linear functions. So I would, rather than just storing in your brain that finite differencing equals convolutions, I'd rather store in your brain that Convolutions are just linear operations, which means you could just express them as multiplying by some matrix. And all this numerical integration differentiation is also just linear operations. And you could also just express all of them by multiplying by some matrix. And that's kind of the common ancestor between the two. And therefore, they're all basically the same thing. And we will look at that matrix on Wednesday, because it's going to be important to us. Um, have a bunch more here, but we're out of time. So we can continue on Wednesday. I'm glad that we got through some of the convolution stuff. Um, but hold on, let me just do the summary. Um, so we talked about backpropagation before you go, um, which was this idea of computing the gradient of a neural net with the chain rule. We talked about all kinds of stuff that we need to do to get these things to actually work. We have to initialize the parameters very carefully. We have to worry about the step size a lot. We have to worry about regularization. There's all kinds of crazy types of regularization. There's this early stopping. Um, so I, and then we talked about convolution. So Wednesday, we'll bring it all together and 
and do some fun stuff. So I will see you on Wednesday.